Well, as you know, we're talking about Joseph. <laughs> Joseph, again, um, just a little bit of a review here, um, going back in God's providential will, he works out things. And even though as Joseph or even us, when we go through some very difficult circumstances, we see and I always remember Romans 8, 38, that God can work together in all things for good to those who are called according to his purpose. So God works out things, even though we might go through a lot of hard times and a lot of difficulties and face a lot of even tragedy. God can work through that to bring through, bring us through according to his will to do that. So Joseph was experiencing something he never hoped he'd have to experience. He was the favorite son of Jacob. Had all these brothers and they found they didn't like him very well. They hated him. In fact, Joseph made him a coat of many colors or a very special coat that even infuriated him more. And so they decided to kill him. And one brother said, don't do it. And so they threw him in a pit. And uh, then along came some uh, traders uh, going towards the route, trade route, and they sold him into slavery. And then they took him to Egypt, and there they sold him into slavery to Potiphar. And so that's the setting of today about Potiphar and what Potiphar did and how Joseph seemed to find favor with Potiphar and uh, his uh, empire, his business, and all that. We'll talk about that. And so God was with him and provided for him. He didn't have to go work in the fields. He was in the household as a servant and all the things that happened to him. So uh, we see that the title today is Pitfall to Temptation. And temptations can lead to a lot of things. Um, sin can be so enticing. The world today with all the flash and glitter and bright lights and all the thing can really entice people to get involved in things that not so good for them while it's going on. It might seem to be really something special, but then when they realize they've given in the temptation and the results, then they express and see sin from a different perspective. So um, this story today gives us an example how we can go beyond temptation and make the right choice, avoiding the pitfalls of sin and attraction and temptations and all those things. So we see what a model uh, Joseph seemed to be. So uh, he was sold to Potiphar, who was a very important e Egyptian uh, official. He was um, had several titles, but he was the, um, well, now I lost what he was. Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. He was very important uh, in the, uh, in the uh, oh, yeah, here it is. He was the captain of the guard. That's a, that's a pretty official title. So he was sold into slavery, and Potiphar bought him. But the Lord was with him. He prepared him, and even though he was a slave, he was a household servant. So he wasn't out working in the crops, the fields, whatever they did, had to do. He was in charge, became to be in charge of the whole household. So Potiphar saw that there was something special about Joseph and the Lord was with him and so he prospered. Potiphar pro prospered as a result of Joseph's ability to lead the household, to take care of everything he had. So Potiphar just put him in charge of everything. You take care of this, you take care of this, you take care of the household, look after the other servants, buy the food, all the things that a servant would do, be in charge of the household. Uh, and so he, all that he did prospered. And of course, it didn't make him any uh, money as far as gain, but it made Potiphar a lot of gain in what he did. And so Potiphar being a very important uh, official, his name means belonging to the son. And so Potiphar was prominent in all that he did. And so he rec it was a pluralistic society and there are many gods. So Potiphar probably had a lot of different gods he worshipped. And so it wasn't any, any problem for him to see that Joseph's God was a special God or he was blessing him. So 
he then thought, hey, if it helps me and puts some money in my pocket, I'm for that kind of thing. So that's what took place. So Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and he appeared to have landed on his feet. Hey, everything's going good right now. He is a slave, yes. He's responsible to Potiphar, but yet he has a lot of freedom to manage the household, to run the household, to take care of the business of Potiphar and what was going on. So he earned favor status because of his personal assistant assistance. So he was a personal assistance, not just slave as such. A lot of people have personal assistances who have businesses or whatever they have. They have somebody hired to be their personal assistant to take care of the day-to-day -day operation and all the business stuff. And all they do is come in and say, what's going on today? Sign a few papers and go out. And they go and do whatever they want to do on that day. So he became in charge and it pleased Potiphar in all that he owned under his authority. So everything he put him in charge of. He did such a good job. Of course, this was God's direction at all times. God was leading him and helping him to accomplish all of this at that time. So the Lord blessed the household and all that he had in the house, not only in the house, but all that he had in the field, even the crops and everything that he had out there. His whole business operation was blessed by God because Joseph was in this position and God was blessing Joseph to give him a... a uh, position within the household and favor to Potiphar to take care of him and let him do these things for him. So God was working out his plan for Joseph and God works out his plan for all of us day by day. And we're grateful for that. Uh, but he was working it out for Joseph's sake, not for Potiphar. God wasn't trying to uh, make Potiphar a richer man because of what was happening. He was blessing Joseph and helping him to get into the position where he would eventually turn out to be uh, a very important person in the whole country of Egypt. Number two, next to Pharaoh. <clears throat> and so God was working through him and in him. So the writer makes two final comments about Joseph. And these have, uh, these have implications with what happens here next. Uh, that said he was a goodly person. Uh, he was well favored. He was well built and handsome. So young man, handsome young man, strong young man. Uh, and so this plays into the picture with Potiphar's wife here in a little bit when we see that take place and what happens then. So uh, Potiphar's servant in some way, this is a par par parable of two ways of life. The ways of sinful desire and the way of godly devotion. Uh, Joseph had to be a person who was devoted to God. All the experiences he had been into up to this point in his life, uh, God had guided him and he was aware of God's guidance in his life. God saved his life, protecting him from his brothers, and protecting him from being killed, uh, protecting him and found it, put him in the right place in Egypt as a slave. And so God was watching over him for a very special purpose. And of course, we know what the purpose was. Eventually, he would become the important person in the whole country of Egypt. And he not only saved his family and all his descendants, but he saved Pharaoh and Egypt from a big famine. Uh, when it came time to uh, take care of in this vision, he said, hey, we're going to have a famine, so we got to do something about it. So he proposed to Pharaoh that they have storage bins put up to store up all the food for seven years because there were going to be seven years of, of uh, uh, famine. Uh, the other day I rode over to Rosedale and went over on the port side and I saw that big pile of grain. I don't know whether it was corn or beans just out there with plastic over it and that was open, of course. I mean, that was a mountain of grain sitting out there. <laughs> And so that reminded me of Joseph. Let's pile all this stuff up and say we're going to need it here in a few years. We're going to go through some years of famine. And I didn't realize that it could sit exposed like that. Uh, with a short time, I guess, they eventually are shipping it out. But they didn't have any bins. All the bins were already full to do that. So that was interesting thought when I saw that the other day. So Joseph um, 
was prepared and he was doing a good job and he's going to meet a challenge here that will cause some different circumstances for him. Um, I didn't read those first verses. Let me go back and read that. Kind of set the story. Uh, back in chapter 37, no, 39. I'll get to it in a minute. Yeah, 39 verses 1 through 7. It kind of sets the stage. Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. He bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph. He prospered. He lived in the house of his master. And when his master saw that he, the Lord was with him, the Lord gave him success. Joseph found favor, became his attendant. Potiphar put, in charge of his, put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all of that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So he had a pretty easy track there while Joseph was in charge of the household. All he had to do was eat his meals and go, and go about his way and do whatever he did as captain of the guard at that time. So that kind of sets the stage for that. And again, as I mentioned, Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, the master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. And so we pick it up there with verses uh, with eight and see, see what happens and how Joseph reacts and what takes place as a result. Well, we know he refused. Chapter, verse 6 says, He refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin uh, against God? So, Joseph has a proposition. And he said, can't do that. How can I do that? The master's put me in charge of everything in this household. Everything except for you and you're his wife. So I have no, no claim on that. Everything except his wife. How can I turn against him? How can I turn against God? Um, so there's nobody greater in this household than, than I am. Everything has been put in my charge to take care of. And how can I do such a great wickedness and sin against God? Now we realize that uh, sin, even though other people are involved, sin is against God. I'm always reminded of Psalm 51 and David's confession. He said, against you and you only have I sinned, O God. So it doesn't matter if other people are involved in our sins and the things that we do. It's still sin against God. And that's the ultimate responsibility we have is before God. If we sin, we have to ask God for forgiveness. We have to repent and ask for forgiveness and help us put us on the track to do what he would want us to do. So we may, um, we may harm other people. We may create problems in our family. We may create problems in our community, in our work. But ultimately, everything we do is sin against God, even though it affects a lot of people. And we see that in life today. So many people involved and hurt because of what some one person does that it creates problems, but it's sin ultimately against God. And so he said, how can I do that? God has blessed me. He saved me from death. He put me in this place, a position where I found favor with the master of the house to take care of all of his business. How can I turn against God and do this? So how can I do this? But she persisted. The wife persisted and gives the same appeal over and over again. And, of course, we know how long a process of time this was that she was making this proposition to him. And so uh, makes it very difficult. But he firmly refused. No, I cannot do that. I cannot do that to, your, to the, my master. Cannot do that to you. I cannot do that to God. 
That's the most important part. part. Uh, so even the best person will face temptations. All of us have had temptations uh, in one way or another, everywhere. Uh, overcoming temptations starts with having a good basis, a firm found standards and convictions in what we do. And of course, temptation knows no season. It's, it's there every day. It's ever present. And we must be on guard against it. Uh, one good thing about heaven there will be no sin there. So we will, there will be no temptations in heaven. We won't even have to worry about that. It will be a thing of the past. And so we always have to be on our guard in making right choices and right, right decisions in our life. It may be appealing. It may be uh, something that crosses our mind. We think about it. But ultimately we say, no, Lord, we can't do that. We can't sin against you and harm other people uh, as well to do that. So in verses 11 and 12, we see the conclusion of this thing as far as the household is concerned, where um, it says, uh, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were, was inside. She called him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So evidently, um, the household was at the right, it was the right opportunity for this. No one other, no other servants were in the household. And so Joseph had to come into the house to take care of whatever business he was there to take care of. And that was the opportune time uh, for her to make this last appeal. And so when she grabbed his cloak, he ran off and left the cloak behind. <laughs> whatever this cloak was, whether it was anything under it or not, I don't know, but he took off. Didn't matter at that point in time. Kind of two garments come into play in Joseph's life up to this point. The first garment, the coat that his dad made for him. Coat of many colors. Now, here's the cloak that Potiphar's wife is holding in her hand that she's going to use against him to create problems uh, for him. And another adventure for, for him as Potiphar, of course, has to side or sides with his wife because he has no evidence otherwise uh, and so he got into difficulty as a result of that. So Joseph was paying a difficult, hard price for doing right. Doing the right thing is not always a pleasant thing to do. But God was still at work in his life, and he had not finished with Joseph yet. He still had things for Joseph to do and a plan for Joseph. And not only Joseph, but all the people of Israel through his father, Jacob. And that eventually uh, put them into Egypt for some 400 years before Moses led them out of Egypt under God's leadership and sending them towards the promised land to go in the direction that he wanted them to go. So a very difficult circumstance. And so Joseph's life is getting ready to take another downturn. First of all, his brothers. They decided to get rid of him. And they were all about ready to kill him when one brother said, no, you can't do that. It won't be right. It'll be a hard thing for Father uh, Jacob to, uh, to comprehend and to stand. He could not stand that. So they left him in a pit, but then took him out and sold him to the group traveling through. So even the best person will face temptations. All of us face temptations. Uh, it's, it's okay to face temptations as long as we don't, you know, don't buy into it and, uh, and experience a temptation. As long as we say no and it's a temptation, we can walk away from with a clear conscience and to do that. So there has to be good, firm standards and convictions. One thing I learned, um, and most of us learn, don't ever say what you won't do. You know, people have said, I'll never do this, that, or another, whatever it is. I'll never do that. Other people might do it. But don't be so um, bold to say, hey, I'll never do that because sometimes it can get us into a difficult situation. So this downturn was coming on because of this right choice that Joseph made that he decided he can't, he can't, he can't say no and turn away, uh, turn away from God and to turn away from the master that he was working for who had been so good to him. So he, he couldn't do it. He said, I can't do that. So he had a good firm basis of why he decided he was not going to get involved with anything at this time. Um, 
the, 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 um, one of the sentences here says, temptations may come. And I change that to temptations will come. It's not a matter of may, it's will, when they come at an unexpected time. So the Lord can work in the lives of his children even amidst false accusations and mistreatments by others. Uh, Herschel Hobbes, who this book is dead, he wrote this book for many years, but it's written in his honor. It's named after him, Hobbes, a commentary. He said, um, let your conscience be your guide. But he asked the question, is this a safe guide in conduct? Conscience simply says, do right. However, your moral judgment must tell you what is right. So there comes a time when our moral judgment, when we say do right, has to be our guide. Is it morally right? Is it the right thing to do? If not, then it's not the thing to do. Um, permissive nature of, of social order today uh, has a difficulty with what's right and what's wrong. Most of it's whatever you feel like doing, then it's okay to do it which we know, of course, that it's not. So we have to have a moral judgment to go along with our judgment of, hey, this just isn't right. This isn't the right thing to do. Um, but God never changes. He's always, this, always the same. We can go through his word in all of scriptures, and God is always faithful to say, do the right thing. God is a moral uh, being God can stand no sin. He doesn't want any sin in his sight. But yet he made a way for us as sinful creatures to have the opportunity to be right in his sight and by, by, by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, his death on the cross provides for us. So we need to make right decisions and right choices as life comes and goes with us. So we're going to see David, I mean Joseph, get into difficulty again after and next week as we move into later on in chapter 39 Potiphar comes home that's quite a scenario isn't it Potiphar comes home and his wife's standing there with a cloak in her hand look what Joseph tried to do <laughs> so what do you think he would decide he <laughs> he has a he has a servant Joseph's a servant this lady is his wife Hey, what side are you going to take? Hey, okay, off to prison you go. So we're going to see uh, Joseph in prison next week in the latter part of chapter uh, 39 and part of chapter uh, 40 to see what happens. So uh, life is not always an easy direction to, to follow. We have a lot of choices to make. Sometimes we make good decisions. Sometimes we make bad decisions, not necessarily sin. Sometimes we just make the wrong decision. They would realize, hey, if I had a choice again, I'd go this other direction. But uh, with the Lord helping us and remembering what he says in uh, Romans 8, that God can work together for good. Even we make a wrong choice, a wrong decision, God can help us overcome that and still be a servant of his and honor him and serve him in all of life. So we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. I only knew one person <laughs> who said they were perfect, but I don't think they were. Not quite. There's no one perfect, no one except Jesus Christ himself. So we're grateful. So we're going to follow Joseph's experience in prison and this vision that he has that gets him out of prison and uh, makes him a very important person in the kingdom, in the government of Pharaoh and elevates him to a very high position which eventually leads his people to Egypt and eventually leads them out of Egypt going to the promised land. So we never know what exactly what God has in store for us, but we can follow his leadership and be, at, to be attuned to what he's trying to do and lead us to do and make right choices according to that. So thank you for joining us today as we study Joseph. We have a couple more uh, uh, well, through the month of February, we'll be looking at the life of Joseph and all the things that happened to him and the people of Israel, of course, that began their journey towards the promised land. Stay tuned to our worship service, which starts in just a few minutes. And we thank you for being with us today and hope to see you again next Sunday. Let's close with prayer. Father, for this day, we are thankful. We are grateful. 
for your love and direction in our lives, how you watch over us and guide us in making right choices and giving us spiritual strength to overcome temptations as they come to us. Lord, we're grateful for all that you do for us. We thank you for your will that guides us in the right direction. May we be attuned to your word and your leadership in our lives that we make right choices according to your will. We thank you for working for good in our lives, even when we may make poor choices at one time or another. But Lord, if we do, uh, we, if we do fail and sin against you, may we ask for forgiveness and repent. Lord, help us to move past that point in our life to where we get back on track with you. Give us safety this week in all that we do. Watch over those who are sick and those who are in difficult circumstances of illness and all kinds of circumstances we face on a daily basis. We love you and we thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.